So it looks like we're about a minute past the hour. So if Aaron and Lisa, if you're ready, I can go ahead and kick this thing off. Sounds great. And Lisa will be the first speaker. Okay. So hey everyone, it's Travis Orr, Village to Village Network. And thank you for joining us for what we, we call the Empowering Villages webinar series uh, that is graciously um, led by either the uh, uh, FTC, uh, our friend Ari over there, or sometimes the CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And today uh, we have Aaron Scheife and Lisa Schiffer Lee with the CFPB, and they're gonna talk to us about financial, uh, is that what it is? Financial type scams or whatnot? We're gonna talk about Older Americans Month resources and resources that villages can use during Older Americans Month to help uh, educate people in their communities. Oh, okay. Well, I totally had that wrong, but. Um, <laughs> Some of them are related to scams though, so. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, uh, without further ado, Lisa, please do take it away. Uh, thanks so much. So hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Schifferly, and I'm here with my colleague, Aaron Scheife. We work in the Office for Older Americans at the CFPB, and we'd like to welcome you to the CFPB's Older Americans Month presentation for the Village to Village Network. As you might know, this year, the theme of Older Americans Month is Communities of Strength. So it's based on the idea that older adults have built resilience and strength over their lives. And in Older Americans Month, we celebrate that strength and the power of connection and in building strong communities. So obviously Village to Village Network is at the heart of building strong communities. And today in this presentation, we're gonna share some CFPB resources that we hope will help your villages make your community stronger. So I think Travis is putting up the slide deck. Um, so once it's up, you can advance to the second slide, please. But I'll just go ahead and uh, keep talking in the meanwhile, because before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit about the CFPB and the Office for Older Americans. The CFPB is a National Consumer Protection Agency, if you haven't heard of us. We work to help make sure that banks and lenders treat you fairly. And in the Office for Older Americans, where Aaron and I work, we do a variety of things. We engage in research policy and educational initiatives to help protect older consumers from financial harm. We also create tools and resources to help older consumers make sound financial decisions as they age. And finally, we help stakeholders by providing tools to support long-term financial security for older adults. All of the materials that we're gonna talk about today are available at consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. They're all available for free. You can order them in bulk at consumerfinance.gov slash order. So what we're gonna do is Aaron and I are gonna trade off telling you about some of these resources that we hope we will, that you will order for your villages and your communities. First, on the next slide, I'll talk to you about Money Smart for Older Adults. This is one of our flagship programs. It's an awareness program that we developed with the FDIC, and it focuses on preventing elder financial exploitation, so scams like Travis was talking about. It offers over two hours of content on a variety of different scams targeting older people, and it uses plain language and has action steps. So, it covers things like family emergency scams, tech support scams, telephone scams, identity theft, and more. So if you want to give a training in your community, this is really plug and play. We provide an instructor guide that scripts a presentation for you. We give you a slide deck, and we also have a participant resource guide. The guide, the resource guide itself is for older adults and their caregivers, and it's in 14 point font. So it's very, very, readable. And we have them in English and in Spanish. So 
If you live in a community where there are a lot of Spanish speakers, then you may want to order them in Spanish as well. On the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about the components of this Money Smart for Older Adults campaign. I mentioned there is an instructor guide. That instructor guide has a presentation planning guide. It has activities. It has the overview of a bunch of different common scams. It has a summary and post tests and an evaluation form. Then we also have the resource guide, which you can use as a handout to people as a standalone guide, or you can use it in connection with the presentation you give. And the resource guide has a glossary of key terms. It has instructions for completing the activities and other information to help people learn the material about how to avoid some of these common scams. And finally, we have that PowerPoint that I mentioned to make it easy for you to give a presentation based on Money Smart for Older Adults. So we hope that you'll think about using Money Smart for Older Adults to teach people in your community about how to avoid scams. And now I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to talk about the Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Networks on the next slide, please. Thanks, Lisa. Next slide, please. So what are networks? Um, the way we define a network is that it's a collaboration effort or a partnership that works to detect, prevent, and or respond to elder financial exploitation. So a network isn't just a one time meeting or rather it's a continued partnership among members. And as you may know, um, the problem of elder financial exploitation really requires a collaborative many constantly different changing forms of exploitation and financial imp exploitation impacts so many different community stakeholders. Holders, from law village to village network to financial institutions and social social services organizations. So our office, the Office for Older Americans, nationwide that have sprung up around the country. Those networks bring together key partners. Like I've just mentioned, Adult Protective Services and others to protect seniors from financial exploitation. And in 2016, we released a report based on our study, which is called the Fighting Elder Financial Exploitation Through Community Networks Report. You can find it on our website. We then decided to start an outreach initiative to really help communities of all different sizes in different states to build new networks as well as to help existing networks grow in size or scope or to help them enhance their impact. So we had about nine or so convenings over a couple of years. And as a result of those convenings, we developed a model for identifying potential networks, coordinating with key stakeholders, facilitating meetings, and building support to help create and enhance these local elder fraud prevention and response networks. And in 2019, we released another report. This one was highlighting this model. We called it Convening Communities to Build Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Networks. So in my view, a village to village network would be a great place to either start or maybe help sustain or grow an existing network. So if you are interested in joining an existing network in your area or helping to start a new one, you can check out our network development guide, which is at the link listed on this page, consumerfinance.gov slash elder networks. We'll go to the next slide. Now, throughout the several years that we were working on this project with community networks, Stakeholders shared with us that they would really benefit from almost a plug and play, um, a template for how to do this in their community. So these network members shared that they are already working busy full-time jobs, as many of us are, and they could use these ready-made resources to plan, produce, and host a network retreat. And they also said that they needed resources and guidance to, again, establish and then maintain the network after. 
if you'll go to the next slide. Um, we released the Network Development Guide in 2020, actually almost uh, one year ago exactly, on World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, June 15th of 2020. We released the guide that contains resources to help plan, host, and facilitate these network um, retreats and helps to establish them, expand their capabilities. Um, we have a lot of different resources there, as you can see on the slide. Let's go to the next one. And in addition to starting your own or helping to enhance an existing network, um, we have a lot of other fraud prevention materials. Let's go to the next slide and talk about a couple of them. The first one are our fraud prevention handouts. Originally, uh, one of our colleagues worked with someone at Meals on Wheels America and decided a placemat, a paper placemat with simple eye-catching graphics and fraud prevention lessons in plain language, English or Spanish, would be a great way to share fraud prevention resources with older adults. These placemats would be there on the table when someone came to a congregate meal site. They would be able to look at the content on the placemat as they were waiting for their meal or as they were eating the meal and discussing with friends. We user tested these placemats and found that in addition to the placemat format, we could possibly provide these resources in other ways. We also found that financial institutions like banks and credit unions, libraries, area agencies on aging, and other aging service providers were ordering these free copies of the placemats. So we created activity sheets with word games, we created bookmarks, posters, table tents, and other resources that are completely free. You can download them or order them in bulk. They're available in English and in Spanish. If you visit consumerfinance.gov slash placemats, you'll find more than a dozen different publications. Lisa and I worked on one together about cyber scams amid the pandemic. There are also um, placemats on romance scams, government imposter scams. So I encourage you to check those out and share them with your community. Let's go to the next slide. Another uh, guide that we have is for assisted living communities and nursing homes and their staff. This, this guide, Protecting Residents from Financial Exploitation, can help staff of these facilities identify warning signs that may indicate financial exploitation. Other types of professionals and even family caregivers can also read this guide to learn more about prevention of financial exploitation of residents of congregate facilities, congregate care facilities. And this guide includes information including a definition of what elder financial exploitation is, information about the laws that govern this, warning signs that may indicate elder financial exploitation has occurred, a model response protocol that includes how to recognize, record, and report financial exploitation, preventing and deterring financial exploitation from occurring, including orientation and training of your staff and information to help um, come up with policies for your facility. Uh, and so you can find this publication at our website, consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. Let's go to the next slide. The next thing that I wanna mention, I always wanna mention this whenever we speak to groups, and so you may have heard us talk about this before, is the planning for retirement tool. Our tool is focused on when is the right time to claim your social security retirement benefits. So if there are residents in your village to village network that have not yet claimed their social security benefits, this easy to use interactive tool could help them decide when it would be the right time for them to claim. It really matters when you claim because if you claim early, your benefit will be reduced versus if you claim at your full retirement age. 
which for most people is 67 years old. And if you wait, you can even uh, gain a little bit more money from that social security benefit if you wait to claim until maybe age 70. And you can find the social security retirement planning tool at consumerfinance.gov slash retirement. Now I will turn it back over to Lisa. Thanks, Erin. Hi, everyone. I'm going to tell you about some of our financial caregiving resources. And when we talk about financial caregiving, what we really mean is just someone who's managing money or property for a loved one. It could be as simple as you know, helping them pay their bills, or it could be as complex as being power of attorney or guardian. So right now we know that there are millions of Americans who are financial caregivers. And with the pandemic, more people have been called upon to act as financial caregivers. So these guides that I'm gonna tell you about are designed to help people who are serving in that role. And I would point out that for people in the village to village network, having a power of attorney or other financial caregiving arrangement, which are discussed in these guides, can sometimes even be a tool to help them stay in their homes and communities longer. So let me show you these guides. On the next slide, you'll see what they look like. We have four different slides to help family members and friends who are financial caregivers. These are all available at consumerfinance.gov slash MSEM, like managing someone else's money. And what they do is they help financial caregivers understand their duties. They provide tips to help them in terms of protecting, investing, and managing money for a loved one. They also have information on benefits a care recipient might be eligible for, like disability, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and a lot more. And the guides also describe warning signs of financial exploitation, how to watch out for scams, as well as information on where to get help. So I would encourage you to use these guides in your villages, not only for village members, but also for their family members. And the CFPB worked closely with the American Bar Association Commission on Law and Aging to prepare these guides. There are four different guides. There's one for agents under power of attorney, one for guardians, which in some states are called conservators, one for trustees, and one for government benefits fiduciaries. So I will tell you a little bit more about each one. On the next slide, you'll see our power of attorney guide. So if you're not familiar with what a power of attorney is, it's a legal document where someone known as the principal gives someone else known as the agent legal authority to make decisions about their money or property. So oftentimes people make powers of attorney so someone else can handle their money if they become sick or injured and can't manage their own finances. It's a very good financial planning tool. In some states it's called a durable power of attorney. Um, one thing to know is that there are healthcare power of attorneys and financial power of attorneys. So the healthcare ones are over healthcare decisions, the financial ones are over financial decisions. Sometimes people don't realize that you need to have both if you want both issues to be covered. Also, a lot of people ask why get a power of attorney? Some people are hesitant to get them because they're worried they're gonna give up control, but they actually give you control to name who you want to manage your finances while you're still able to name that person. And that person, you can set up the power of attorney so that person only takes over when you're unable to manage your finances. So you retain control until you're no longer able. So a uh, power of attorney is a very good financial planning tool. And you're here a little bit more why when I talk about guardianship. But on the next slide, I wanna tell you about our guide for government fiduciaries. That's basically just someone who is managing government benefits for someone else. If it's Social Security benefits, then Social Security calls it a representative payee. If it's VA benefits, then the Department of Veterans Affairs calls it a VA fiduciary. Uh, but either way, the thing to know about these types of fiduciaries or financial caregivers is they manage the government benefits only. They don't manage the rest of that person's financial affairs or other property or medical matters. So. If you do want to manage other money beyond the government benefits, then you need something like a power of attorney or guardianship. Um, oftentimes people don't understand this government fiduciary relationship. So this guide can also be very helpful for people who are in this role to have and to provide to other people who are trying to understand what the role means. Now on the next slide, you'll see our guide 
for guardians. As I mentioned, in some states it's called conservators, but it's really the same thing. This is when a court comes in and names someone to manage money or property for someone else. Once the court has found they can't manage it alone. So for example, if you maybe you're in great health, but then you got hit by a car um, and this happened to my grandmother, unfortunately, she was hit by a car and went into a coma. And so we had to get guardianship for her because she had not written out a power of attorney um, before then because she was in good health and probably thought she didn't need it. But that shows you know, why getting power of even if you're still in good health. Um, if not, you go through the guardianship process and the court has to determine the person can no longer manage their finances and then name the person to manage the money or property. So you can see how the power of attorney gives you more control to name who you want, whereas the court will name who they think is appropriate at the time. So the guardianship process is very helpful in these emergency situations and a variety of other situations um, as well. So this is a good guide to learn more about that. And on the next slide, you'll see our guide for people who are trustees. Um, and we're talking about the legal document type of trust. There are two types of trust, one that's created by a court and one that's created by a legal document. Our guide has to do with what's called a revocable living trust, which is a legal document. And what that document does is it gives someone else legal authority to make decisions about the money or property in the trust if that person can no longer make decisions themselves. So the nice thing about a trust is you can just put some money or property into it. Like you could just put your car into it. You could just put your home into it. You could just put $20,000 into it. Um, and that's all the trustee manages is that money or property. So the guide has a lot more information about that type of financial caregiving relationship. And on the next slide, you'll see another guide that we have that we call planning for diminished capacity and illness. This is something that we at the CFPB worked with our federal partners at the Securities and Exchange Commission or SEC to create. It's a consumer advisory on planning for the future when you might not be able to manage your money or property. So this kind of comes earlier in the stage before you get to those guides that I just discussed. Um, sometimes it's called diminished capacity when you're no longer able to manage your money or property. And so this advisory has advice on planning for that time, planning for your financial future, getting your documents in order and watching out for financial exploitation. So this advisory is a useful tool, even if you feel like age related decline is in the far distant future because it can help you, your parents or other loved ones plan for the time uh, when, you know, all of us, if we're lucky, are growing older. And uh, so it's good to plan for that time. It also has good time tips to help you manage money when the time comes. So another, along those lines, on the next slide, you'll see a brand new publication that was just released uh, week or two ago as part of our Older Americans Month uh, events. It's called Consumer Care Options. And this is part of our Managing Someone Else's Money campaign. So you can find it again at consumerfinance.gov slash MSEM. And it's designed for people earlier in the caregiving process. Maybe you're just starting to notice that you or a loved one might need help with managing their finances. So this is a really short publication and it lets you know your option. It covers informal caregiving options like convenience accounts or adding a trusted contact person to your account. It also covers the formal caregivers that we just talked about like power of attorney, guardian, trustee, or government fiduciary. And finally, it gives you a list of questions to consider to help you determine who is the best person to choose as your financial caregiver. And this is a very important decision because we know a lot of times other financial exploitation happens because of choosing a caregiver who is not necessarily the best person for that role. So we hope you will check out this publication and all the other ones that I just mentioned. Again, you can find all our publications at consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. And now I'll turn it back to Aaron to talk about some of our reverse mortgage publications. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. 
Great. So we at the CFPB have created resources about reverse mortgages. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a reverse mortgage is a product for adults 62 years and older. The mortgages that the type of reverse mortgage that we'll be talking about is a HECM, a home equity conversion mortgage. This is a really, uh, a really niche product that doesn't work for everyone but it is a product, um, if it works for you, it's a great one, but there's a lot to know. And it actually, um, you are required to go through housing counseling if you decide to pursue a reverse mortgage. I won't talk much about the product. Um, instead, I'll tell you a little bit about the resources, which do a much better job of describing the product than, than I could do here on this webinar. And we actually did a webinar on reverse mortgages for the Village to Village Network a couple of months ago, so I won't go into this in too much detail. But we have, re we have resources for two different parts of the process. The first is pre-origination, so that's before you get a reverse mortgage. If you just want to know about the product, know what it is, and if it would work for you, we have a know before you owe two-minute video which will give you all of the key concepts and features of the reverse mortgage. We have considering a reverse mortgage, which is a really brief four page guide that would give you just a really brief um, background on the product. And then we have the reverse mortgage discussion guide. If you are considering, um, shouldn't use that word because we use it in the other publication, but if you are really seriously thinking about getting a reverse mortgage. The reverse mortgage discussion guide is a great tool for you. It goes into all of the details, including what you would do if you had to go into a congregate care facility, like an assisted living or nursing facility, um, or if, you are, um, if you're away from the home for certain periods of time. So definitely check those out before you get a reverse mortgage. And once a borrower has a reverse mortgage, a borrower because it is a loan, um, we have a couple of resources for reverse mortgage borrowers. The first is a brand new resource that came out about um, maybe two months ago called You Have a Reverse Mortgage, Know Your Rights and Responsibilities. And it doesn't get more descriptive than that, folks. The title of it is exactly what you need to know. It tells you about the rights and responsibilities that you have when dealing with that kind of loan. We also have the Reverse Mortgage Borrower's Guide to Natural Disasters. Um, this guide is helpful if your home is damaged in a flood, a hurricane, something like that. Um, it also proved somewhat helpful for people who were um, experiencing issues um, with Hurricane Maria a couple of years ago. That's kind of how the, the idea for this guide came about. And then we also have reverse mortgage resources um, on our housing hub, which has a lot of COVID-19 specific housing related information. Let's go to the next slide. And you can find all of these resources on the reverse mortgage page on our website. It's consumerfinance.gov slash reverse mortgage. Let's go to the next one. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly since I already kind of talked to you about them. This is um, what the reverse, considering a reverse mortgage guide looks like. It's really short, plain language. Next slide. The discussion guide is more of a booklet which gives you really a tool that you and your housing counselor can walk through together to determine if this product is right for you. Next slide. Our brand new guide, the Reverse Mortgage Rights and Responsibilities Guide, tells you how you can pay off your loan, what happens if you move out of the home or if, pass, if the homeowner passes away, what their heirs need to know, and then where to go for help if they have questions about their reverse mortgage. Next slide. This is a um, screenshot of that Reverse Mortgage Disaster Guide, again, um, there are ongoing obligations that you must meet if you have a reverse mortgage. And so this tells you a little bit about how that can 
those obligations can be met while you're dealing with something that is damaged, possibly damaged your home. Next slide. This is a screenshot of the page and here you'll see the video. If you click on the circle with the play kind of symbol, the triangle in the middle, you'll see that quick two minute video. And it is again, a really good primer for you to find out what a reverse mortgage is. Next slide. I Thanks, Erin. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about some of our COVID-19 related resources and financial protection. TV, we know the pandemic has affected a lot of people and even while all the health impact, financial impact is still a huge issue for a lot of people. We know a lot of people are still behind on their mortgages and their rents and have other financial challenges that during the pandemic. So we've created consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus to help people protect pandemic financial challenges. So these resources are available in English and Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and Tagalog. So they are a great resource for a lot of different communities. Some topics include current information about how consumers can financially protect themselves, it has information on credit and debt management, student loan repayment, mortgage relief options, scam prevention, and even things like online and mobile banking tips. So there's also information about financial caregivers and a bunch of short videos like the ones that very quick ways to get an understanding of financial issues. So we encourage you to check out this website and some of the videos uh, that are available there. On the next slide, you'll see our housing hub, consumerfinance.gov slash housing. Erin mentioned this as well. It not only has the reverse mortgage information, but a whole host of other information about help available to people who are struggling with paying their mortgage or rent during the pandemic. We launched this as an interagency housing website with the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Federal Home Finance Agency. So it's really designed as a one-stop shop for people to find information about housing relief options during the pandemic. Again, you can find it at consumerfinance.gov slash housing. It has information about the foreclosure moratoria for certain federally backed mortgages. The servicer can't foreclose on you until after June 30th. It also has information about forbearances there are some forbearance options for certain federally backed mortgages until June 30th. So again, if you know anyone who's behind on their mortgage, please encourage them to check this out right away because there are some deadlines coming soon, June 30th. Uh, also for renters, there's information about the CDC order, uh, which paused evictions through June 30th as well as well as the latest status of that order, which is on, under some dispute in litigation. So check consumerfinance.gov slash housing for the latest information and resources for people who do need financial help with their housing during the pandemic. On the next slide, you'll see some of the other coronavirus resources we have that are specifically designed for older adults or people who are working with older people. We have tips for financial caregivers. So. If someone's unable to be with someone whose money they help manage due to virus prevention tactics or quarantines, uh, they can use video chat or phone. Fortunately, hopefully a lot of that is coming to an end, but a lot of people have found that those were most helpful and may continue post pandemic. So I would encourage you to check out these tips for financial caregivers who may be doing the financial caregiving remotely. We also have online and mobile banking tips. We know that there were some people who were new to online banking during the pandemic. And so this gives tips for those who are new about how to handle their finances from the comfort of their home. And finally, we have something that we call planning your finances for an uncertain future. And we know the pandemic changed a lot of people's financial circumstances really quickly. So what this does is it's a tool to see if you and those you care about have plans in place if you become unable to manage your finances. 
It's a blog that has tools to help you answer the questions. And there's basically a questionnaire that you and your partner can do to see if you're both able to handle the finances equally well. Plus there are tips for things like creating a plan for your virtual assets. We also have a lot of other information online at consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus about scams related to online shopping, related to funeral expenses, relating to unemployment and EIP payments, tech support scams, vaccine scams, and a whole lot more. So please do check out these websites. They are kept up to date and you can find the latest information there. And now I will turn it back to Aaron for some ideas on how you can use some of these resources that we've been discussing. Thank you. So we wanted to share with you, let's go to the next slide. We wanted to share with you a couple of ways that you could use these within your village to village network. Um, so we of course had a lot of different resources um, that you can share and you can do more than just order copies and hand them out or order copies and place them in a literature rack for people to take. Um, the first thing that we suggest is really for you to increase your own self-awareness. So even if you are not a homeowner or even if you are not interested in a reverse mortgage loan, it never hurts to learn about some of those products so that you can help someone else. Or, um, if you think, oh, I'll never fall victim to a scam. Um, first of all, that's, you shouldn't think that. Just about anybody can fall for a scam. Um, but I would say definitely take the time to educate yourself about some of the issues that we've shared with you today. And then share that awareness with family, friends, neighbors, congregation, um, any other kind of groups like your book club or any, any groups that you work together with, including your network your village to village network. You could join an older adult financial fraud prevention work uh, network that we discussed earlier in the presentation. And again, distribute information and resources in your community. And when you do that, um, you're helping to build communities of strength, not just during Older Americans Month, which is shortly to close in just a couple of days over the weekend, um, but during all times of the year. Let's go to the next slide. Um, if you are a professional, if you are one of the key volunteers for your network, you can identify and coordinate opportunities for presentations. Um, there's still time to do something for World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, which is June 15th. So you've got a little over two weeks when you can reach out to, um, to people in your community and educate them on different types of fraud, scams, financial education, or uh, financial fraud and other types of um, elder abuse. You could perhaps uh, train yourself and others to present our Money Smart for Older Adults Fraud and Scam Awareness Program, or you could establish an outreach effort, again, to support independence and reduce isolation of older people in your community, which I think is basically exactly what the Village to Village networks do. Let's go to the next slide. This is our closing slide. We have our website, which we've said a couple of times during the webinar, consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. Our email address is olderamericans at cfpb.gov. And we check that email address multiple times a day. So if you find that during this presentation, there were a couple of things you thought you would hear about, but you didn't, could be that we just didn't mention them or it could be that we haven't worked on them yet. So definitely send your ideas to us and you may see a resource someday come about because uh, you requested it. So don't hesitate to reach out to us at olderamericans at cfpb.gov. I think we can take it, if there are any questions, happy to take those. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, but maybe Travis, we can give folks a couple of moments if they do have questions to type those into the chat. Oh, great question. Um, and I'm gonna turn this one to Lisa. Um, for those who have already been scammed, what resources are available? Lisa, can you answer this one? Sure, that is a really great question. Um, I mean, one thing, first of all, I would encourage you to report to the Federal Trade Commission um, at ftc.gov complaint. 
you can file a complaint with them there and uh, they will give you resources related to your particular scam. Um, but also check out the CFPB's Money Smart for Older Adults campaign that I mentioned at the start of the presentation. That covers a whole variety of different scams um, and can tell you what to do with a particular type of scam because what you need to do is going to vary if you were involved in a tech support scam, for example, then you may need to, you know, clean off all the personal information from your laptop, update your antivirus, you know, contact the gift card company, you know, these are the tech support scams when someone remotes into your computer. Whereas if you were involved with a romance scam, you may want to do things like, you know, take down or change the passwords to your social media profile if it if it started there or block the person that's involved and of course in addition to reporting to the FTC you can also if you lost money to the scam you can report it to your local authorities in order to try to get um, money back you can report it both to the local police and also to um, your local consumer protection agency your state attorney general or some counties have consumer protection agencies and I would encourage people not to be shy about reporting. Like Aaron said, anyone can be a victim of a scam. So do report and try to get your money back. It's often very hard to get the money back, but uh, don't be ashamed or embarrassed to report and uh, do report and try to get your money back. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Aaron, or if there are any other questions, people can type, type them into the chat. That's all I would say. Um, I think you hit it, the, hail, the nail on the head there. Um, I don't see any other questions. So again, I'll just note um, our website is consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. And you oh, can find a lot of, oh, go ahead, Lisa. Sorry, I see another question. I think it was added to the same question is, I think they're trying to ask is online banking safe? Um, which is a very good question. And the answer, not to be too lawyerly, but the answer is it depends. I mean, yes, it can be safe, but you need to make sure, first of all, that you're doing any online banking using only a secure connection, and then you're doing it from, you know, a place that's not public Wi-Fi. So, you know, don't do your online banking from the coffee shop or the airport. I know people aren't really going to those places that much now, but soon and increasingly people are. So make sure that you have the secure connection and you're doing it from a secure place if you're doing any online banking. Um, and also, you know, make sure that you're going to your bank site by typing in the URL. If you get an email with a link to click on, that could be a phishing scam. So do not click on the link. It could download malware onto your computer. Um, but online banking can be safe when done safely. So. Are there any other questions? Okay, looks like that's it. Um, Travis, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Aaron and Lisa. Very informative. And again, uh, just a reminder that this presentation will be available on the B2B Network website, and I'll send that around in the newsletter as well. Feel free to share this uh, among your own village members uh, so that we can keep having uh, the CFPB and FTC come and present to us. Uh, I think it's very valuable. So unless Barbara has anything else, that's it for me. Sorry, I was late to the party. I was on another Zoom call. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you guys, Aaron, Lisa, for um, your time. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much. And everyone have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.